Oh, well said, my noble Scott. The speaking truth in this fine age were not thought flattery such attribution should the Douglas have as another soldier of this season stamp should go so general curve through the world. Oh God, I cannot flatter. I do defy the tongues of soother, soothers. For the braver place in my heart's love hath no man than yourself. Nay, task me to my word, approve me, Lord. Thou art the king of honour. No man so potent breathes upon the ground, but I will fear thee. Do so, and tis well. What letters hast thou there? I can but thank you. These letters come from your father. Letters from him, why comes he not himself? He cannot come, my lord. He is grievous sick. Soons, how is he the leisure to be sick in such a rustling time? Who leads his power on whose government come they along? His letters bear his mind, not I, my lord. I prithee tell me, doth he keep his bed? He did, my lord, four days ere I set forth. And at the time of my departure thence, he was much feared by his physicians. I would the state of time had first been whole, ere he by sickness had been visited. His health was never better worth than now. Sick now, droop now. The sickness of the pick of very life, blood of our enterprise, tis catching hither even to our camp. If he writes me here that inward sickness, and that his friends by deputation could not so soon be drawn, nor did he think it meet to lay so dangerous and dear a trust on any sole wound, but on his own, <laughs> yet he doth give us bold advertisement that with our small conjunction we should arm to see how fortune is disposed to us for, as he writes, there is no quailing now because the king is certainly possessed of all our purposes. What say you to it? Your father's sickness is a maim to us. Perilous gash, a very limb-lock, oh, and yet the faith it is not. His present one seems more than we shall find it. Were it good to set the exact wealth of all our states all at one cast, to set so rich a maid on the nice hazard of one doubtful hour, it were not good. For therein should we read the very bottom and the soul of hope, the very list, the very utmost bound of all our fortunes. It's it, and so we should. What now remains a sweet reversion. We may boldly spend upon the hope of what is to come in. A comfort of retirement lives in this. A rendezvous, a home to fly unto it, that the devil and this chance look big upon the maidenhead of our affairs. But if I would, your father had been here. The quality and hair of our attempt brooks no division. It will be thought that know not why he is away, that wisdom, loyal to your latest light, of our proceedings kept the earl from hence. And think how such an apprehension may turn the tide of fearful faction and breed a kind of question in our cause. For well you know, we of the offering side must keep aloof from strict arbitrament. And stop all sight holes, every loop from whence the eye of reason may pry in on us. This absence of your father draws a curtain that shows the ignorant a kind of fear before not dreamt of. You us. strain too far. I rather have his absence make this use. It lends a luster and more great opinion, a larger dare to our great enterprise than if the earl were here. For men must think, if we, without his help, can make a head to push against the kingdom, with his help we shall all turn it topsy-turvy down. Yet all goes well, yet all our joints are whole. As heart can think, there's not such a word spoken of in Scotland as this term of fear. My cousin Vernon, welcome by my soul. May God my news be worth a welcome. The Earl of Westmoreland, seven thousand strong, is marching hitherwards. With him, Prince John. And no harm with more. And also I have learned the king himself in person is set forth, for hitherwards intended speedily with strong and mighty preparation. He shall be welcome too. Where is his son, the nimble-footed madcap Prince of Wales, and his comrades that doth the world aside and bid it pass? All furnished, all in arms, all plumed like estriches that with the wind, baited like eagles having lately bathed, glittering in golden coats like images, as full of spirit as the month of May, as gorgeous as the sun at midsummer, as wanton as youthful goats, as wild as young bulls. I saw young Harry with his beaver on, his creases on his thighs, gallantly armed, rise from the ground like feathered mercury. He vaulted to his seat with such ease as if an angel dropped down from heaven to turn and win the fiery Pegasus in which the world of noble horsemanship. No more, no more! Worse than this, on it much, his praise that they're the shagues. Let them come, 
They come like sacrifices in their trim, and to the fiery eye made of smoky war, all oh, hot and bleeding will we offer them. The male and Mars shall on his altar set up to the ears in blood. Oh, I am on fire to hear this rich reprisal is so nigh, and yet not ours. Let me taste my horse, who is to bear me like a thunderbolt against the bosom of the Prince of Wales. Harry to Harry shall hot horse to horse, meet and ne'er part till one drop down a course. Oh, would that Glendower were come. I learned in Worcester, as I rode along, he cannot draw his power these fourteen days. This is the worst tidings that I hear of yet. I have found my faith that bears a frosty sound. What may the king's whole battle reach unto? To thirty thousand. Forty let it be. My father and Glendower being both away, the powers of us may serve so great a day. Come, let us take a muster speedily. Doomsday is near. Die all, die merrily. Talk not of dying. I am out of fear, of death or of death's hand for this one half year. 